Then we're gonna go through the climate regions, different types, and apply them to Europe. Uh, so we're gonna see three main types, uh, the marine west coast, the Mediterranean, uh, and then there, from there, uh, we'll just call it the humid continental. Uh, but let's go through each of them through the alphabet A through E. A climates, do we find any here? No, why? Because we're not in a tropical area. We associate A climates with tropical uh, uh, locations. B climates, we do see some B climates. Now, this map isn't perfect. Uh, you know, it doesn't specifically describe every single area. You've got, might have rain shadows and, you know, small little pockets that are semi-arid step that aren't shown. But for the most part, we do see a good amount there in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, in, in definitely there in southern and eastern Spain. Uh, although it's not shown on this map, we also see it in Kazakhstan, uh, but much of, of Russia uh, is a semi-arid steppe climate. In fact, steppe uh, comes from, uh, is a Russian term, it's an old Russian, uh, and it essentially means transition from forest to desert. It's a steppe. Uh, at least that's how we're going to refer to it. Uh, but it's essentially a, a Russian derivation, and much of Russia is a semi-arid steppe, especially the west, or sorry, the eastern part, which we don't cover on the other side of the Ural Mountains. Next up is a sea climate. We see two different types of sea climates. So in the case of Northern America, we saw the Mediterranean climate uh, there in Southern California, and then poleward or towards the north of the Mediterranean climate in uh, California, we saw the marine west coast climate. Well, what do you know? We see that same pattern here where to the south we find the Mediterranean climate and then to the north we find the marine west coast climate. So we can kind of associate the, the yellows and the golds there that we see in Greece, Albania, Italy, the southern part of France. A um, good amount of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, those are Mediterranean climate regions. Uh, and so what's going on there is they have a particular pattern in which they have a pronounced wet season in the winter and a pronounced dry season in the summer. And I've already explained that, but the wet season is when the mid latitudes, uh, you know, the, the low pressure belt moves over the area, brings precipitation. But in the summertime, the subtropical high pressure brings dry conditions to this particular area. I'll further explain and how, you know relate that to the wine industry and Catholicism uh, later on. Uh, in the green part, we see the marine west coast climate. So just like we saw in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, here we're going to see a little bit more rain. Now we're getting a lot of more precipitation because of that North Atlantic current, also known as the North Atlantic Drift, also known uh, as the Gulf Stream, that's bringing warmer and but moist air to uh, the, the, the British Isles, to France, to Northern Spain, to the Benelux countries, to uh, Western Germany, uh, parts of Denmark and small parts of Norway. So essentially that warm, moist uh, current is coming and bringing with it precipitation that we see throughout much of the year. Uh, so we, if you ever watch for uh, soccer, uh, British Premier League soccer, I mean, in half the games, it's dreary looking. I mean, very rarely do you see sunny skies. It's very common. Uh, and so they get a good amount of precipitation, which once again is going to be conducive to agriculture. I'm going to come back and tie the climate to agriculture here in a minute. So in the case of the uh, Western Europe, we see these two predominant types of sea climates uh, in the southern part, the Mediterranean, and in the northern and western part, uh, more the marine west coast climate. <clears throat> now let's go away from Western Europe and we go to Eastern Europe. And for the most part, we see D climates. Uh, so once again, D climates, we're going to associate with being more continental. So they're not going to be along a coastline. Of course, we see that. Uh, we definitely see those landlocked countries throughout much of Eastern Europe, but also into Russia, we see uh, that uh, particular deep climate. And so that lighter color is associated with a temperate continental uh, uh, climate. Uh, and so this is the moral of the story here is uh, because it's continental, it's going to have pretty hot summers, but brutally cold winters. But with that being said, you know, where in the United States do we see a deep climate with uh, brutally hot summers, but cold winters is in the Great Plains, in America's breadbasket, uh, in Canada too. Uh, so the area that produces a lot of agriculture in the United States and Canada too, uh, very similar to this particular area. It includes the Ukraine, Poland, uh, 
Uh, so this is Europe's breadbasket, let's say, in which it produces a lot of agriculture and thus, uh, because it's in the North European plain, also is where we're going to find a lot of the historical settlements, but a good amount of population still to this day. Uh, to the north of the uh, the, the temperate uh, continental climate uh, is what we see. The darker uh, blues, or maybe even uh, darker uh, turquoise, uh, is related to the subarctic climate. Uh, so that's similar to what we saw in Canada. Remember we talked about the boreal forest. Uh, that dense forest that goes from one side of Canada all the way to the other. Uh, it's got bad soil for agriculture, good soil for pine trees. And so uh, we see the, you know, this dense forest also over here in Scandinavia and northern Russia. Now, of course, you're also going to see this in uh, upland areas as well. Uh, once you get to a, a high enough altitude, so for example, in the Pyrenees Mountains, in the Alps, you'll also see uh, this subarctic climate, the taiga climate or the vegetation type, the boreal forest or the dense evergreen forest uh, in a very similar climate, even though it goes up altitude wise and gets that similar temperature characteristics that you'd find at a high latitude like you do in Scandinavia, Northern Russia, and also go, don't forget our good friend Iceland that's up there in the top left-hand corner. Uh, so that gets us to uh, now our D climates, finally our E climates. Uh, so we see E climates in highland areas at the very, very high elevations. Uh, so we're going to find these in the Carpathian Mountains, the Balkans, the Alps, the Pyrenees, and also in some upland areas that are up there in uh, Scandinavia, particularly in Norway, but also in Iceland. Uh, so those are areas in which it's permafrost, not much grows there. Maybe it might have a very short growing season, uh, you know, short grassland uh, areas, maybe a, a little flower uh, blooms for about two, three months, and that's it. Uh, it's done with the, the living things uh, up there in this area that's been recently uh, heavily affected by glaciers. So essentially, that's a big snapshot in terms of the climate. We can now relate this to uh, vegetation, but also booze by looking at the alcohol belts of Europe. And so this relates to climate. Uh, and so we look at the wine belt. We find the wine belt in the Mediterranean climate region. Uh, and so characteristic of, uh, of wine is they typically need grapes. Characteristic of grapes is they like to have conditions that are a very dry summer and a wet winter. And so grapes do a good job of holding in moisture. That's why grapes are juicy. And so they hold in that moisture during the dry summer period. Uh, and so that's critical for creating wine. I'm not going to go into the nuances of making wine. But we can, of course, find that there in areas that grow grapes. Other things that grow uh, well in the Mediterranean climate, olives, uh, cork, uh, the cork tree. So you know, there's a reason why our, our wine is corked uh, with cork, uh, because it comes from a tree that grows in this particular area because it essentially can withstand the very dry periods that are often associated with summers. Another characteristic of the Mediterranean is we get a lot of uh, the, the particular areas, a lot of forest fires, particularly in the summertime. Uh, a lot of the vegetation gets dry. You add in maybe a lightning strike or a really, really hot summer, uh, you know, week or two, and then you can you trigger forest fires or grassland fires, brush fires, which are very common in the summertime in Mediterranean climates. We also have a lot of citrus. Uh, we also have wheat. Uh, and so this kind of explains maybe why we see wheat uh, bread uh, so crucial in Catholicism. Also, we see wine. Uh, in terms of the next belt, we have the beer belt. And so we think of Germans, we think of beer. We think of Irish, we think of beer. Uh, we think of the Brits, we think of beer. Uh, it's because what grows well there are grains, uh, the key ingredients uh, for growing uh, growing beer. Uh, in fact, the Czech Republic uh, is the number one country in terms of beer drinkers in the world. Uh, so kind of gets overlapped with the growth of wine here of late, uh, kind of kind of hides uh, a lot of the beer that's grown uh, there in the central uplands uh, where we see a lot of the grains uh, of, of Europe grown. Finally, we have the, uh, the, uh, the blue area, which is the vodka belt or vodka. Uh, and so there, of course, the Soviets, the Russian uh, 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 areas. Uh, we also see it in Sweden, Finland, uh, Norway to a certain extent, um, but they're not really shown there as being bright blue. Uh, so what else grows there? Potatoes, which is critical to growing vodka or growing vodka, creating vodka. 
uh, turnips, beets, cabbage. Uh, moral of the story is Russians, they're not known for their food, uh, but they're definitely known for their booze.